Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. It's uh, great to see you out. Um, bank holiday weekend, so I guess there are some folks are uh, being away, so we'll miss some, but it's lovely to see you here and trust it, you'll know the Lord's blessing uh, on you this morning as you worship with us. For church online as well, welcome to you. Um, trust that you too will be blessed as you worship with us. And for anyone else listening or watching uh, from afar on Catch Up, we trust that God will bless you as you join with us at a distance. And if you're able, please come and visit us uh, sometime uh, in person. Well, it's my task um, as uh, Julia and Robin are away this weekend to just to remind you of the uh, notices for the week ahead. Hopefully you've picked up a notice sheet um, as you came in or you've had it sent to you uh, by, by email. So take a read of that um, just to remind you of a couple of events taking place during the week, uh, Tuesday evening, uh, prayer time at 7.30 here at the church, and a couple of events on Wednesday um, as normal at 10 o'clock, uh, the community cafe, and in the evening uh, is a ladies' uh, friendship evening at 7.30, um, a craft evening with Jan Beckett. I don't know if any ladies want to say anything more about that. I've not been giving anything extra, but if not, I guess you know all about it. So turn up here on uh, Wednesday uh, evening. Next Sunday, of course, we worship normal time, uh, 10.30 in the morning when our Pastor Cole will be uh, the speaker. Just uh, on the back of the notice sheet, sometimes there are one or two items uh, on, on the back, um, just really to bring to your attention um, the Jubilee weekend, which is fast coming upon us. We're now into May, Sunday 5th uh, of June. Uh, we'll be celebrating the uh, Majesty the Queen's uh, Platinum Jubilee. Where there'll be a family service here on that uh, Sunday morning. So we're hoping to encourage and invite many people from the area to join with us during that day followed by events here at the church. There will be a barbecue and uh, food here, activities uh, for the children. Bouncy Castle has been booked, um, I understand, and various other activities. So that Christian motorcycle people coming along. Trev, yeah, excellent, good. Yeah, so that, that'll be great to have those there. So look out for notices. Publicity is being prepared to leaflet the area and for you to give out. So make a note of that in, in your diaries, on your calendars, that Sunday the 5th of June. Uh, one notice from uh, White House Baptist Church over the other side of the, the Norwich Road there, and they're having a family uh, first fundraiser on the 7th of May, 10 to 12 uh, during the day, and the various activities going on there. I'll put the notice uh, on, on the uh, board at, at the back for you to have a look. So that's 7th of May, is that next Saturday? Must be, yeah. 7th of May, well, whenever. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, all because we, we yeah, elders and deacons won't be here, will we? <laughs> um, if you've been out into the cafe, you'll have noticed that work is now underway on the floor, but it, the way is blocked uh, uh, there uh, because the flooring has been taken up. So if you need uh, to use the uh, toilet facilities, uh, the main block you'll need to go out of that door or you still can obviously go around there to the accessible uh, toilet uh, around that way but you can't walk down uh, the, the corridor uh, at the moment and just a reminder uh, to you that after the service every Sunday room three out the back and round there is available for prayer if there's anything that you feel that you would like to pray with someone ab about, maybe from the service this morning, or maybe something that's happening in your lives, and you'd appreciate just somebody being with you to pray with you, please go into room number three, and you'll be joined there by folk to pray with you. Right, I hand over to Pastor Cole now at the moment to take the rest of the service.
you hear me now? Yeah, it's gone through. Good. Lovely. Let me start again. So let me just carry on plugging the uh, 5th of June, okay, for the Queen's Jubilee Platinum event here. There's a lot of money that's been put, put in this. It's a real chance for us to reach out in the community. It's a day of grace. We're doing loads of things during the day and not charging a penny. Um, so, you know, people can come here, have cups of tea, there'd be um, uh, uh, t tea, in, tea in the community cafe or coffee, there'd be barbecue outside, there'd be going to be a, uh, a lovely big bouncy castle, there'd be uh, games using a parachute and other things in the, in the area out there, motorbikes, there'd be a vintage car, no doubt lots of vintage people, and car. it's really, the idea is to be a fun event for the community and to get people in. And so we need people here to support what's going on, uh, we're gonna have, we need people, uh, some people for first aid in, I don't know if anyone here is any good at face painting, um, not, not putting on makeup, I mean, um, you know, making a panda face or something, uh, that kind of thing. That if you are, let, come and see me, please. And any other things you could offer that we could do for a stall, then please let me know, because that would be really useful for that particular event. Um, before we carry on, we've got another couple of notices. First of all, I'm going to invite Sally out to give a notice. Thank you, Sally. Sally. <laughs> I'd just like to say thank you very much for all your prayers. Winters had her operation, everything went successful, and she should be back in Ipswich in two weeks. Thank you ever so much. I really do appreciate that. Thank you, Sally. And also during the week, um, I think it was Tuesday morning, I got a call from, a, and a Monday morning, I think it was, I got a call from Margaret about her daughter, Claire. And um, last Sunday, uh, Margaret's daughter was having medical, um, a medical assessment done, and they discovered a very large mass on her stomach. Um, and this was confirmed, in fact, by three doctors. Um, so Margaret was obviously, and Peter were devastated by this news. And um, she then contacted a, a, a prayer chain that she knows personally of a large Pentecostal church in the town. And a lot of people began to pray for this. And she went for further tests on Monday and she had a scan and they could not find anything. Uh, the scan, the mass had literally disappeared. Um, so that's in incredible news um, and just shows the power of prayer. And, uh, so, and that's absolutely wonderful. So we're now going to spend a few moments just thanking God for that before we read from the Psalms. Father, it's very easy for us as Christians sometimes to get bored with prayer. We pray a lot. And some of our prayers aren't answered in the way that we want because you are a good God and you only answer prayer in the best way. And Father, we want to thank you for Sally's news this morning that baby winter, the operation's gone really well. We want to thank you for hearing pr prayers of your people. And we pray, Father, even now that you may put your hand upon that young child and that, Lord, you may continue to breathe health and vitality into her body. Lord Jesus, bless baby Winter. Bless her mother, Ivy, and bless Sally and the family. And we just pray, Father, that they may each one know your hands around them at this time. And we thank you, Lord, and we celebrate the healing um, of Claire, Father. Father, you know how worried and concerned both Peter and Margaret were over the, uh, last weekend when they got the, the devastating news. And we thank you, Father, for all the prayer that has been offered up for Claire. And we thank you, Lord, for that declaration that the Mass has gone. But she is totally clear. Claire is clear. <laughs> we just thank you for that, Father. We worship you. We thank you, Father, that you hear prayer. And we pray, Father, that you may help us to get a renewed sense of the need for prayer. Lord, if we're to reach Witten and, and to reach Ipswich and this county for you, it's not going to be because we're such great Christians, because our smile is so big and because we walk along to church with a bounce in our step. It's not even because we can pervasively ar argue for Jesus or, or, or recite um, the Ten Commandments or other Christian teaching. It's only going to be because your spirit is working and drawing and revealing that he has been lifted up and that you are opening eyes and unstopping ears 
And we just pray, Father God, you may do just that for this area. Pour your spirit upon this area. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And now I'm going to invite one of our younger members of the church to come up and read from the Bible. Thank you. Psalm 119, verses 6, 9 to 16. How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? I seek with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I, may not, I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. I will not neglect your word. Let's stand and sing our first song this morning. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Let's bow our heads again and, and let's come before our Lord, our God, in prayer. Lord, we thank you that your word is indeed a light unto our feet. A light that shows us the way. A light that gives us guidance, but shows us the dips and the cliff edges. A light that shows us the steps we must make day by day. And Father, that can be a real journey of faith because... As with most torches, we can't see all the way. We can only see so far. We can't see around corners. We can't see over hills or down into valleys. We can just see enough. And we then need to trust you that your word is true and your word is trustworthy and that we can go in that direction even if we can't see all the way because we trust your word is truth. 
And we trust your word is, is trustworthy and good because you are a good and trustworthy God. And Father, we thank you that as we look today at this whole, the whole picture that the Bible gives us of what the Bible is, would you may encourage each one of us to learn to shine that light more and more into our lives and into the lives of others. To have confidence in its beam. To have confidence in its content. And even when, Father, sometimes that light may highlight things that are difficult to understand in the 21st century, that we may struggle with, and certainly our society may struggle with, to trust you. Because when you speak to us, Father, you only speak truth. And to realize, Father, that he who is the liar and the father of lies is the devil. And he's seeking to mislead and distract people in this world in which we live and is seeing much success in the 21st century. So, Father, we come before you now and as we gather around as a Christian fellowship to worship you, to sing songs of praise and worship, to read scripture together and to learn together that your spirit may be here. Shining the light of truth into our lives. Giving us understanding. Helping us to grow in our faith. To become stronger as believers. To have greater confidence and greater faith in you, Father God, and in your word. Help us to do business with you on this Sunday, the 1st of May. And may we just know, Father God, your presence in a very real way as we gather here. Because we gather here, Father God, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Who taught us to say... Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. For many years, Fiona and I lived in Scotland. Of course, you know Fiona's a Scot. And uh, the Lord's Prayer in Scotland, you actually pray, forgive us our debts. And I think come the end of the month, that's quite a nice thing to pray, isn't it? <laughs> but now we're on the first Sunday of the month, so our debts hopefully have been repaid. New, new wages have gone into the bank, and so we don't need to worry so much about our debts. But we, they pray for debts, we pray for trespasses. And talking on the Scottish theme, I've been told, Margaret, it's your birthday today. So, (laughs) happy 21st. (laughs) Happy birthday. I I take it your birthday is a reason for the bank holiday, is it? Yeah, absolutely, that's good. (laughs) Oh, my. (laughs) So, you're a friend of everyone. Fantastic. Now I'm going to ask the band to come back up again, please, and we're going to sing a great song by Rend Collective, My Lighthouse, and then another couple of songs. Thank you.
We're now going to have one, a song which is really more directed to tools for children about every step, and we're going to play it from the videos, every step along the way. song reminds me to get some brighter footwear. I feel rather boring wearing black. I should be wearing pink and light blue. God is with us every step. And today we're looking at the Bible. The Bible is something some of you may carry into church on Sunday. Hopefully most of you read every day. Some of you may carry it on your phone. You may have it on your tablet, on your computer at home. The Bible. And we're going to be looking at Hopefully, we'll be looking at. Um, there we go, the book. Looking at just what the Bible is 
about. Now, I take it that all of you have at home books. Am I right? Nod, be with me. It's a family service, needs a lot of interaction. Next Sunday, next time we sing that song, I want you to see you step in rather than just standing there. We've got to start to follow the steps, get with the, get with the motion, the program. Okay, so, right. All of you have books, different types of books. And there are, generally speaking, well, it were when I grew up, two types of books, weren't there? The most obvious type of book was the kind of book that when it served its purpose as a book, it could become a doorstop or sort of other things around. And that was, in fact, what we can refer to as hardbacks. Called hardbacks because they have hardback. That's it, they have a hard cover. And these are great books. These tend to be library books, didn't they? So if you went to the library, most library books are hardbacks because they last longer. And if you go to second-hand shops, you'll find there's far more old hardbacks than softbacks because when softbacks get, um, you know, when they, when they get older, they kind of fall apart. And so if there's hardbacks, then obviously there are also softbacks. And most of us, when we buy books from Amazon or from Watershins or other bookshops, most of us go for that variety. I try and go for the big varieties because I like to keep books for a long time. Um, but um, if you want a book that you're just going to read and then dispose of, soft pack's the way to go because they're only designed to last for a short period of time because they have a soft pack. And of course, nowadays in the 21st century, we have another type of book. What kind of book could that be? Ebooks, that's right, yes. An ebook. I've used these in operations. They're great because when you go to, went across to Afghanistan or Iraq, I could carry a library in my combats just in my, my, my leg pocket. I carry my, my, um, my little uh, ebook and I'm sitting on a Hercules or on the back of a helicopter and I've got time to read. I'll get the book out and I'll get myself Im immersed in this ebook. The problem with ebooks is several fold is that one is they're, very, they're quite heavy, they're more heavier than normal books. And I've almost knocked myself out some nights when I've been laying in my bunk in my ebook and looking at it and then I've fallen asleep and I've dropped the ebook on my head and uh, that's not a pleasant experience. And now, now I've given that job and responsibility to my wife. Um, I don't read ebooks anymore. I'd rather have a head torch on a proper book. Fiona reads ebooks and occasionally she falls asleep having her book above my head as well. And she wakes me up. You know, I wake up and think, what's going on here? And she's laying fast asleep, um, potentially with a big smile on her face. But um, Ebooks. Ebooks are great because they've got lights behind them, haven't they? So you can read them at night, and it's great. You know, you don't need to rely upon a torch, and you can carry lots and lots of books. The problem with ebooks for me is that I lose my place. I don't know where I am. I like in a book to know I'm halfway through. I like to know I'm making progress, and you know, I can read for 100 pages, not have a clue how far I am through this ebook, and I find that slightly disturbing. I like, and I also, I am a terrible marker of books. If I find a quotation, it gets marked in red and highlighted. And my study books are full of marks and annotations because I like to, like to try and absorb what I'm reading. So e-books are not particularly for me. And the final reading I prefer a normal book is I love the smell of a new book. You know, when I was doing my, my first degree, I remember every, every, at the end of every term we'd have our exams. And I used to treat myself, if I'd done one of my exams, Going down the book, going down the bookshop on the first day of, of the, at the end of, end of term, and buying myself a, a novel to read over the next few days. And I used to love the first thing you did was get a cup of coffee and open that new book and just breathe in the binding and the smell of a new book. I love that. You can't get that from an e-book. I'm sorry. E-books are great for certain things, but you can't get the smell of a freshly bound book. So there's various types of books we have. Okay. And there's a great variety of themes. See if you can tell me what kind of themes these are. What kind of theme could that be? To kill a mockingbird. Yes. Fiction. Well done. Right on the, right on the note there. Well done. Absolutely right. Harper Lee, a brilliant book. Remember reading it as a, as a child at school. To kill a mockingbird. It is fiction. And that kind of book's called a novel. Okay? It's a fictional book about a great a story. Okay, what kind of book could that be? I, Claudius. Who's read this? Real tome, this is. Good book. Fantastic series by the BBC. What kind of book could that be? Yes, go on. Sorry? Um, it, 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 it's, it's a good, good, good answer. It's actually half and half. Because it's historical fiction. So historical fiction, our books are based upon half fiction and half fact. So we know Claudius existed. You know, all the other, his brothers and sisters in, 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 the, in the play, all rural characters. You know, we know, generally speaking from the Roman historians, the general characters are right, but he then introduces 
conversation that we would never be privy to hear, you know, and, and invents relationships and things that happen, but generally within the premises of a historical event. So he will give you a reason why certain things happened the way they did, why Claudius rose to such power. And it's great, great, great BBC drama played by Derek Jacobi, a great Shakespearean actor. Okay, right, what about that kind of book? What kind of, that's the, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's the kind of book Val reads, isn't it, Val? <laughs> I saw you hanging around there when the policeman was there, Val. So, okay, it's, you know, the Duchess still, girl marries Duke. You know, everyone's, well, not everyone, certainly not mine. Um, but it's, what kind of fiction is this? Anybody knows? Yes. Soppy, soppy, okay. <laughs> okay, it's, 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 it's romantic fiction. Let's, let's be, not, not be, some people love this, and it's fine. It's, you know, it can be... So it's romantic fiction, okay? But again, it's fiction. It's, it's you know, stories about r romance that, that could not... And a lot of our classics, Jane Austen wrote a lot of romantic fiction. You know, it was romantic fiction. It was, and it was, you know, classical writing. So, you know, it's not just the likes of Tessa Dare. You know, there's lots of really good books that are romantic fiction. Um, the, the Victorians love romantic fiction. What about Andy McNabb, Zero Hour? What kind of book's that? Yeah, War? Thriller, yeah. Thriller, action books, lots of books. Andy McNabb obviously served with the SAS, so he, he writes and he's got their author of Bravo 2 Zero. So it's meant to be, you know, it's going to be particularly authentic uh, thrillers. Um, yeah, perhaps, perhaps not. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a thriller. It's a book that you're meant to excite you and draw you in. Any fans of Bernard Cornwall here? What kind of, what kind of writer is he? War, yeah, true, that could be war. He writes a lot of books about war. Historical, it's a historical fiction, yeah. So rather than um, historical fiction like I, Claudius, that's half and half, this, he, he writes in a period and he can invent characters. But the period, and there may be key events, could be true, but actually generally it is a fictional account of what may have, may not have occurred in that particular period. Period fiction. What about this? Sci-fi, that's right. Great Bear was one of the heroes of my when I was a young person, he's a really good sci-fi writer. But sci-fi is science fiction. So again, it is fiction. Okay. Some is very good fiction. Arthur C. Clarke was a, was a scientist. Some of his fiction is now coming into place. He's predicted a lot of things that happens. Um, and other people, like Asimov, who talks about robots and, and, um, and, and the mechanization of, of machines, you know, some of the things he predicts with these, these men have a scientific background are actually coming true. But, but it's, they write in the, the basis is science fiction, but they write using their scientific knowledge of, and predict what may or may not happen in the future. Ah, oh, The Hobbit. What kind of book is this? Very good, yes, very good, okay. <laughs> there we go. Um, but, but Kelly, what, what kind of book is it, though? What kind, of, what kind of type of book is it? Fantasy, that's right. So is fantasy fact? No, it's fantasy. So it's, it's fiction, okay? Another type of fiction. We've got lots of different types of fiction out there that can be really good to read. Okay, so there's a great variety of types. There are factor, factual books, and we've got loads of types of books that are factual, like biographies. Okay, you've got books that are histories, Herodicus, that's the uh, Claudius book, is based upon some of the writings of Herodias, who was a uh, Roman historian. You've got factual books written, investigative journalism, writ written about events or organizations, like this one here on ISIS. You've got travel books. If you go away on holiday, you know, if you go to some exotic location, you may want to buy a book that gives you some idea of what's out there. Um, so you've got travel books. And of course, then, the most interesting of all the books, I'm sure, I'm sure Josh will agree, is course books, like English and physics and mathematics. You love your mathematics books, don't you, Josh? You don't? You, d you do? Oh, that's good, okay. Yeah. You like English, not maths. Okay, what about history and literature? Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, geography at the bottom there. So you've got course books like that, which of course are factual. And then you've got the books you collect when you go to college, university, um, which you, you read and enjoy. And perhaps those books will become doorstops later on in life. So a great variety of different types of books. So I've got a bit of a test for you now. Okay. I want to see if you can tell me, um, don't try that, put your hand up, if you can tell me the possible... Name of the authors I'm going to show you now. And the first section is a selection of children's authors. Tell me, first of all, the name of the author 
And secondly, uh, one of their famous books. Okay, you ready? Okay. Lots of authors. Go on in, yes? David Williams, what kind of books did he write? Do you remember? Yeah, children's books, yeah? Yeah, one of his favourites? Um, comedy types, yeah, any names? Any particular names? Sorry? Ice Monster, well done, that's right. One of the ones that's particularly famous is Gangster Granny. Okay, could be a few Gangster Grannies around here, I don't know. Um, but David Williams, famous children's author, okay, jolly good. Who about that person? All right, so another, she wrote lots of children's books. Lots of, lots of children's books. Non-Eating Blighter, no, good try. Beatrix Potter, that's right. And she wrote the famous words, you know, the uh, ones of Peter Rabbit and uh, Jemima Puddle Duck and all those kind of characters from the riverside. Lovely, lovely books. And she also not only wrote them, she illustrated them. So, who's this chap here? Not C.S. Lewis? No, no. Good try. A bit older than C.S. Lewis. No, good try. No, it's a good try. No, it's not George Tolkien's. He's a man that never wanted to grow up. Barry, that's right. J.M. Barry, who wrote... Oh, sorry, it's not A.M. J.M. Barry. It's A.M. Mill, who wrote Winnie the Pooh. Oh, good grief. Again. Yeah. Sorry, he looks very similar to J.M. Barry. So... <laughs> How about this one? This is, most of you should know this character. Great writer. C.S. Lewis, Charles Staples Lewis. His famous books are... Surprised by Joy. Yes, that's a good one. That's his biography. Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe is probably his most famous. That's right. The whole Narnia series um, were, 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 were how he became famous initially. And, of course, he's famous for lots of other good books as well. How about this man here? Great moustache. Uh, we've already mentioned his name. Uh, no, it's not Tolkien. No. J.M. Barry. This is J.M. Barry. And he it was a man who invented Neverland, where the pe boys don't grow up. And the famous character, that's right, is Peter Pan. That's right, it's J.M. Barry. More recent writer. Very recently, she writes, uh, illustrates a fam a famous stories about a monster. He's not a monster. Sorry? The Gruffalo, that's right. She wrote the Gruffalo. It's, it's Donaldson who wrote The Gruffalo. That's right. Well done. That's good. Now, the, most of you should know it. No, who's that? Enid Blyton. And what's a famous book? Sorry? Famous Five, that's right. The Famous Five, Enid Blyton. Okay, jolly good. Another famous British author, really good. We used lots of his books and his stories for our, our boys when they were growing up. Kind of, the stories are all, can be slightly weird. He kind of, he was, wasn't um, straightforward, wrote some brilliant stories. A lot of them were made into films. If you like Oompa Loompas, So who wrote Charlie in the Chocolate Pantry? Ronald Dahl, that's it, Ronald Dahl, that's right. Most famous for Charlie in the Chocolate Factory and James and the Giant Peach and the BFG, that was a big one in our family, the big friendly giant. Okay, right, okay. Now, come on, who knows this person? J.K. Rowling, who, and what did she write? Harry Potter, what was the first Harry Potter book? The Philosopher's Stone, well done. Well done, that's good. Okay, that's good, right, that was for the children. Okay, we're up in the ante now for the adults. Okay, what about these famous adult authors? Okay. There's a big clue in, in the book he's reading. Arthur C. Clarke, that's right, I've read loads of books by Arthur C. Clarke, most famous perhaps for 2001, The Space Odyssey, but he's written, writ, written lots and lots of really good books and often... Um, very, very um, interesting um, ideas. Arthur C. Clarke, how about this chap here? One of my favourite authors. He's one of his books recently was made into a film, only released a few months ago. Quite a few of his films, uh, books have been made into films. If I say, say a couple of names like Pompey. Robert Harris, that's right, yes. And this, um, he wrote 
Munich, which became a film recently. Very, very good film. Again, he's a historic, historical writer, and he writes about, around about historic, historical event periods, but actually invents the actual character and the story that goes into it. Robert Harris. Okay, how about this one here? Very famous American author. Yeah, sorry? It's John Gushin. Well done. Yeah, brilliant. That's one of his examples. Firm, but he's got so many books. If you want a guaranteed really good read at a holiday, get a John Grisham novel, because I, I find you, you just can't put them down. Really very good. Uh, who's this lady? Her, her most famous novel has been made into a series, but Margaret Atwood. That's Margaret Atwood. That's right. Famous for what series? What book? The Handmaid's Tale. That's right. Yes. Yes, Margaret Atwood. That's a, that's a face you should remember from the 80s. Salman Rushdie, what did he produce? Sorry? I mean, what was his most famous book, or most infamous book? Satanic Verses, that's right. And he got a fatwa put upon his name and had to go into hiding. It cost a British taxpayer thousands of, or millions of pounds probably, even the amount of police protection has had to be offered to him because there was death threats made upon his life. Salman Rushdie, right, okay. How about that man? Writing particularly about a, a theatre, a, a, um, a country that's been in the news a lot in the last 10, 15 years, particularly last, last summer. If I mentioned the word Afghanistan, no one got it? It's Kala Kasuni, who wrote the very famous The Kite Runner. Really, really good book. If you haven't read that, it's a good book to read. And A Thousand Splendid Sons was his follow-up to that. Now, this is a really good British writer of the Cold War era. Spy novels galore. John le Carre. Who was his famous character, John le Carre? Tinker Tailor was a book, that's right. Tinker Tailor Sword Spy, that's right. And his most famous character is George Smiley. And Smiley as people, and all about that, you know, as a, as a Cold War warrior myself, I remember when I went to, um, I served on Ch Checkpoint Charlie for a while, and I remember um, going back to Germany when Fiona and I went out on our last tour, and going to Berlin, and going into the place um, which, which, you know, where the wall had come down. And it had been quite emotional, but he really, he really got hold of the atmosphere of Berlin and the Cold War during that time. And I just, it was, it's so vivid, and you, you can remember it if you served there. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. What about his friendly face? Good writer from the States, now lives in this country. Bill Bryson, that's right. So one of his favorite, he's got lots and lots of different books. Is, sorry? The, the Body. Well, that's not one I've heard of. Okay, well, it's, he's a good writer. He's a good, Fiona likes to read stuff by him. And he's, one of his famous stories about a walk in the woods. And he was deeply pleased because when it was made into a film, the person who played Bill Bryson was Robert Redford. And Bill Bryson was very, very impressed that he got Robert Redford to play him. Um, so, uh, yeah, really, a really good film if you haven't seen it, The Walk in the Woods. So lots of different authors, different people who actually have written books. Books play a massive part in our lives. They really do. Authors and writing. And it's important, actually, we actually you know, be aware of that because, you know, sometimes you can get messages in books that actually aren't particularly very, very good messages. They can actually sway you in a, diff a wrong direction. So you need to make sure that you've got the right book in your life to actually filter out all the different stories. But some really good stuff there, some really good entertaining books. And there are many books written about many, many things, many different themes and writers and authors. And the end of John's Gospel, in John chapter 21, it says this. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose, but even a whole world would not have room for every book, for the books that would be written. John was saying there could be many, many, many books written about Jesus. But actually, there's only one really important book. And we're going to look at that later on during the service. So we're now going to stand and sing uh, the, our offertory song, um, which is the Fruit of the Spirit song. And the worship band are going to lead us in this now. I'm going to teach you the chorus. 
Chorus, first of all, um, so that you can join in. Um, it's a bit of a tongue twister. I think I know Sarah knows it, but other than that, I don't know if yeah. anyone else will. No. Um, the chorus goes like this. Because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you can go that low, you're doing well. Okay. Um, you can see it's a bit of a tongue twister, and we will try and speed up a little bit as we're going along. Okay. We'll just do it once more so you get an idea of it. Okay. Thank you. Please take your seats. We're going to look and turn to Scripture now. We're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter 1 and verses 12 to 21. 2 Peter, 12, 2 Peter 1, 12 to 21. 
Here, Peter writes, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it right to refresh your memory, as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have a prophetic message as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a bright as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. May God bless to us that reading of his word. So we're looking this morning at the book. The book. Who can tell me what the word Bible means? Who can tell me what the Bible, word Bible? You know, I've talked to you quite a bit of German, German, uh, Greek in the time I've been in the church. What does the word of the Bible mean? Only one person. Go on, Kevin. Sorry? Library. Okay, yes. Well, quite literally, the word biblios, yes, means book or library. It's, it basically, when we talk about the Bible, we're saying it is, the Bible is the book. Biblios is, when you think of the word bibliophile, bibliophile is someone, philos is the word for love, and biblios is the word for book. And so you've got bibliophile is a lover of books. A lover of books. And when you have the Bible in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your hand, you have a book that is literally the book. It's literally not a book. It's not one of many books. It's not similar to other books. It is literally, the word means book. And it is, as, as Kevin mentioned, a library because... It has not just one book, but how many books are in the Bible? 66, right. How many in the Old Testament? 39, and that leaves how many in the New Testament? 27, that's right. You've got 66 books in one book. Wow. That's, so you have got a library. And what's interesting in this book is that, well, it's, it's different to other books. Now, some of you will have a hardback version of the Bible. And we've got hardback versions of the Bible we give to people when they come into church. We, they give mainly hardbacks because they last a bit longer. Some of you, like me, may have a, a softback version of the Bible. And my favorite version of the Bible is, up, I'm, sure I'm going to bring it down, but it's upstairs in my office, is the Bible I carry everywhere. And it's a softback, but it's actually inside, a, I put it inside a, a case that's got a zip on it, okay? And that's so it keeps it all together. And when it goes into into dusty places, it doesn't get damaged. And of course, I've also got a copy of the Bible. In fact, I've got very, various versions electronically on my phone. Okay, so yeah, so you've got Bibles, electronic copies, you've got physical copies, hardbacks, softbacks. But then the question comes of all books that we asked earlier on is that, well, we know that J.K. Rowling wrote the books about Harry Potter, and we know that Julia Donaldson wrote the books about the Gruffalo, but who wrote the Bible? Who wrote the Bible? And that's quite difficult because you've got 66 books. You've got different writers for each of the books. And that, even that doesn't really help us too much because, well, the Bible is a very special book. I mentioned to you earlier on, one of my favorite authors is Robert Harris. And he wrote a great book. And the book is called The Ghost. 
And it was made into a film some years ago and stars Ewan McGregor in the main part. And it's a really quite exciting thriller. Um, it's about a British Prime Minister who's got secrets and he wants someone to write his biography. And he, he wants someone to write him, but because he's a Prime Minister, his main skill set is not necessarily in writing. So he calls in someone who is a writer to write his story. And when you call someone who's a writer to write your story, they're called a what? A ghostwriter, exactly. There's someone who you can't see. They're behind the main writer. There's someone you can't see who actually is formulating the word. So the person who may be the person you're writing about, I mean, there can some, some people, particularly footballers perhaps, who are not particularly very good with words. They're better with small little balls. They can kick, kick around the pitch. Okay, so if they wrote a book, it would be very difficult to get interested in. So they get a ghostwriter who can write, you know, make it interesting and, and put things together but actually, actually make an, an, an enthralling story. Um, you get ghostwriters, writers who are behind the scene. You know, and this is very true of the Bible. Except we don't just have a ghostwriter, we have a holy ghostwriter. <laughs> because one, because your Bible is not just any book. Often the, you'll find in the first few covers of your book, it says not just the Bible, does it? It says what? what? The Holy Bible, right. And what does the word holy mean? Do you think, do you think God's saying that you know, Jesus wanders around the pair of jeans that are full of holes. He's very fashionable. He's got tears all over his jeans. You know, and he's very, he's very holy, holy Jesus because he's very fashionable. Is that what he's saying? What does holy mean? Separate. Separate that's right. Set apart. Different. When, you do, when something's so holy, it's something that's only used for a sacred purpose. So you may have things. When I grew up in London, in South London at the time, or in London generally, there was your front room was the holy room. The holy room of the home. You were only allowed in the holy room on certain days. We could go in there on Sunday afternoon if we're lucky and well behaved. You went in there Christmas, special holidays. When family came around, you went into the holy room in the front room. That was a, a, but only, in, only on these special days. Every other day, okay, you weren't allowed in the, lounge, in the front room. The front room was special. It, all, the, all the cushions were pumped up specially. You know, it was well dusted. It was looking immaculate. Didn't want the hand, messy little fingers of children around it. So it was, you weren't allowed in the front room. It was a holy space. It was set aside. It was special. And the word holy means exactly that. It's set aside. It's special. It's not common. And the Bible is a holy Bible. Because it's set aside. It is special. It's not like any other book. It is literally the book. The book. In human history, if you want one book to read and to remember, that is the book. I've got hundreds of books. I love loads of authors. I enjoy reading. I enjoy studying. I enjoy all that. But the book I want to know most about in my life is a book that's special. A book that's holy. It is the Bible. And there's a very good reason for this, and we'll be talking about that in a moment. But the important thing about this is to remember this, is that the Bible isn't just from human authors. It has a Holy Ghost writer behind it. A Holy Ghost writer. And we read about that just now in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. For prophecy did not have its origin in the human will, i.e. the human authors, the prophets. Though, human, uh, though humans spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if you've ever been carried along by anything. I'm a climber. I love going up mountains. I remember my first experience of going up the cobbler in Arica in, 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 in Scotland with a friend of mine, Gordon Campbell. And we got to the top and we were carried along by the wind. We're carrying heavy rucksacks and we couldn't stay. We were kind of being, trying to stand still and being blown along towards the edge. And we had the only way to get out of it was to drop literally on the floor and get out of the wind. Otherwise, we'd been carried along over the edge. Strong winds. I've done many other times with that. And once we, when I was, um, used to lead uh, teams of students at London Bible College up, we had a very, very small girl behind me. And I was leading a group up towards the top of Snowdon. And we're going on the back, one of the back ridges up the Gladstone Path, and up the back ridges. And it's a really um, close spine. And it was a very gusty day. And there was this girl behind me. And she got caught by a gust of wind. And she was literally lifted off her feet. And two of us even started to get hold of her and bring her back down again um, because of the power of the wind. And of course, we exploit the power of the wind, don't we? Kites. 
You know, a kite hangs up there not because it's got some kind of little piece of string going to heaven. It hangs up there because it's suspended on the power of the wind. That's why birds can soar. They get the wind underneath their wings and they can soar. I used to go gliding when I was a kid with the air training car and we could, you'd go around in the skies in the gliders and you'd find a thermal. And if you found a thermal, we could literally climb the thermal, go up this column of hot air and then come out and glide around a bit further. And if you didn't find another column of hot air, you'd end up having to land. And so you'd be searching around for another column of hot air and you'd find it and start to circle and go back up again. That's the skill of gliding, is going from column or hotel. You get the wind underneath the wings of this very light aircraft, and it keeps you afloat. If you've been ever to the seaside and seen people who are, who are, um, who are on, uh, on, on boards and, they're, and they're on, on the sea, and they're trying to, to control their, their sail, sailboarding, you know, they are being carried by the wind, and they bounce along the waves. It's wonderful to watch. I mean, it's great. They get to that stage. They're very skillful because I've done sailboarding many times and been blown off my board, you know. But they get they get carried and they can hold and control the wind. And Peter is saying that people who've written scripture have been carried along by the Holy Spirit. They're willing disciples who are listening to God and God has spoken into their lives and given them the words. And as they write, they're being carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's why you can trust the Bible, because it doesn't have a human author. You know, when I'm reading some of my human authors, you know, you have to take some things with a pinch of salt. You know, when you're reading Andy McDab, you think, yeah, okay, Andy, that's a bit, you know, that's not really going to happen. And, and you watch films, don't you? And it doesn't need to be Marvel comic films. Anything with Tom Cruise in it tends to be pretty impossible, you know. You know, Mission Impossible, it's not just impossible, it's... It's downright in- incredible, some of the things he does, you know, especially with motorbikes. You're thinking, has he ever ridden a bike? You know, can you really do that on a motorbike? I don't think so. Um, and, you know, it's basically, you know, human authors, they exaggerate. You know, they, 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 they over it. God tells the truth. He makes people, he gives them his word, and people are carried along by the Holy Spirit. And possibly the most famous verse ever about this is that wonderful verse in 2 Timothy 3. And, G- and, and Paul is talking to his young protege, Timothy, and he says these words. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Everyone, everyone who reads the Bible is literally listening to God speaking into your life. The words are God-breathed. It comes out of the mouth of God. Breath and wind are the same thing in the Hebrew word ruach. The Holy Spirit speaks ruach, breath, wind. It's the same thing. The Holy Spirit is seen as the wind of God, the breath of God. And God speaks his words in Scripture. And just in case you're not clear, it says quite clearly there, all Scripture You know, it's not a minefield. When you look at the Bible, you don't need to think, am I going to come across a bit that's not God-spoken or not God-breathed or not true. You know, God doesn't give us half-hearted gifts. He doesn't give you a a pudding, a delightful pudding that's got barbs in it or a bit of poison here and a bit of there. And your job is to find out where it is. All Scripture is God-breathed. May not, always be, not all of it may be easy to understand. Some of it's written about periods a long time ago. You may need the guidance of commentaries. Or someone, um, you know, people who have actually, you know, have, have known Scripture for a long time to help you understand some of the areas of Scripture that you may struggle with sometimes. But it's all God-breathed. It's all useful. It's all important. So what type of book is the Bible? We know it's got a ghost writer, a holy ghost writer behind it. We know it's a book that has 66 books to it. But the question is, is it Fiction. Or is it fact? Is it like a historical novel that's perhaps bit fact, bit fiction? Is it like a period drama that's totally fiction? Is it like a historical book, like a factual book, like a course book? Well, the answer to that is actually found in the Bible itself. Jesus said this in John 14. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father 
except by me. It displays it, the words of Jesus, and Jesus speaks truth. He doesn't speak untruth. He speaks truth. I've been a Christian um, since I grew uh, a young lad. I grew up in a Christian family. I went away from it all. I tested it. I've rejected it all because I felt, well, is this really true? And I had a period away from God when I was in the Royal Air Force. And I came back to God at the age of 19. And when I came back to God at the age of 19, um, from that moment onwards, the Bible has been a constant source of comfort to me because I know I can rely upon it. Not just bits of it, not just parts of it, but all of it. Because it's true. And I've based my life upon this, and I can really guarantee that God does not let you down. When he says something, he says it for a good reason. Because he knows us, and he's our creator. Which one of us, if your washing machine is going wrong, would think, right, the manufacturer's manual says this, but oh, forget it. There are any Zanussi. What does Zanussi know? You know, I've, I've never exactly been inside a, uh, a washing machine before, but I'm sure I've got some tools. And I, I can sure I can work it out. And you start d dismantling the, 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 the Zanussi dishwasher or the washing machine or whatever, and you're dismantling it, and you're basically just going in there with a bit of hammer knock here and a probe here or your screwdriver, and at the end of it, expect it actually to work. Of course you don't. You go to the manufacturer's manual. You go to the person who made it, the person who knows the way it should operate. You know, when, when, I, when I'm doing work on my motorbikes and we're trying to tighten up a, a, a screw, you always find the torque wrench. You always find the torque rate. Because if you don't, and over-tighten the bolt, you can strip the bolt out, and then you've got a lot of money to replace that bolt. Because the, all the pressure will go from that bolt, and oil will start to leak from your bike. Going from the manufacturer's instructions is critical to know exactly how to put things back together. And when it comes to our lives, if we go anywhere else or think we know better than God, we are a fool. We are a fool because God knows best. He's our, he's our creator and he's given us scripture to guide us. And the great thing is that Jesus said this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You know, sometimes the church has been accused of the traditionalists who believe the old ways. These aren't old ways. You know, do we talk about gravity in the same way, the law of gravity? Oh, <laughs> Newton, well, he, he was a man of his time. You know, we don't all agree with gravity nowadays because, well, let's face it, you know, he lived three or four hundred years ago. A bit of an old geezer, you know. I, I suggest, you know, you try it yourself. Go up to the edge of a cliff and jump off. Who knows? You may be able to get winged underneath your arms flap high enough? Of course we don't. It, just because it's old law or old truth doesn't make it non-truth. When we sometimes ridicule people who believe truth that's been around a long time, don't. It's not tradition. It's truth is truth. Truth ultimately doesn't change. And Jesus said, my word is truth. He said that heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. That means even when this terraformer underneath your feet is gone, we're in a different existence, you know, enjoying life in eternity with God, his words will still be true. They may be millions of years old by that time. Billions of years. But they're still true because truth is truth. God has given us his truth in the Bible. A book that's full of truth, that's full of ability to shape our lives. That's what faith is. It's believing that God is speaking truth. And the great thing about it is rather like going into a, a, into a, um, into a, a, into a, a, um, a supermarket and wanting a tin of beans. You know how confusing that is nowadays? You want a tin of beans and there could be 10, you know, Heinz used, used to talk about 69 varieties. Forget about 69 varieties. Hundreds of different varieties of beans. Okay? And it's a nightmare. Isn't it great when you know that you, know, you like one type of flavor made by one manufacturer and you can pass all the hundreds of varieties of beans and just walk along in Tesco's and pick up the one you want and put it in your basket? Because you know that's the one that you want. And the great thing about knowing the truth of Jesus Christ and knowing the truth of the Creator God is that you can bypass all the other ideas, all the other philosophies that are clamoring for your attention, that are trying to distract you down the aisle and you can just focus on the truth. Because God's word is truth. Jesus said this. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you, know the, then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. God wants to set us free. 
You know, and in this day and age, we've got so many, so many clamoring voices, so many philosophies that are saying, listen to me, I am truth. You can know, but you can shut them all out if they're not the voice of Jesus Christ. You can shut them all out and go to the Word, the Bible, which is not a book, it is the book. So when you see things on TV but disagree with the Bible, what's right, what's wrong? Well, I'll tell you what's right, the Bible's right. God's the creator. He put us together. He knows what's right. And when you hear voices in your books that you think what's right and what's wrong, you can say, well, this is the book. that has the Holy Ghost writer behind it. The breath of God, God is speaking. I can believe that. You know, there's some very persuasive authors and writers and papers, and some of them I love, but they are all human and they're fallible, and sometimes they say things that are wrong. But I can come back to the Bible and say, whatever God says to me, is true because his son is the way the truth and the life and only his teaching his word can really set us free let's pray lord you tell us that there are many there could be many many books written about jesus but we know that there's only one real book that we need to build our lives upon and that's your word and we thank you, Father, that you have not put us on this planet and made us and then just kind of forgot about us and said, get on with it. You've given us a guidebook. You've given us a way to understand life, to interpret and to filter all the voices that we hear. Lord Jesus, help us to trust you. May we step up in faith. And, and although sometimes it can be difficult, and can be confusing, just know that when you speak, you speak truth and learn to listen to you. And ask for your Holy Spirit to help us understand, to lead us into the truth. So bless us each one, Father. Help us to really become students of the book. To really read and to learn to read the book. To understand it and to learn it and, and to enjoy it. And may it shape our lives. And may it set each one of us free. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to stand and sing our final song, which is that lovely song by Stuart Townends, From the Breaking of the Dawn. From the Breaking of the Dawn.
come to the end of this service, we pray that you may help each one of us to really love having our Bibles, love reading them, love knowing that when we read them, you speak to us and your word is truth and knowing that your word can set us free from things in our lives and ultimately freedom from sin through your son, Jesus. Lord, help us to be students and help us, Father God, to be able to soar on wings like eagles with your breath underneath our wings, growing in faith, growing ever higher and learning to trust you and to trust your word in our lives. And help us, Father God, also to bring that word to others, to say to others and encourage others that there is truth and that Jesus can set you free too. So go with us this week, Father. Help us to carry that message in our hearts. And may your love change us and produce more of the fruits of the Spirit, Mm -hmm. that we might not be lemons, but be people full of grace and truth, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, love. May it shine in our lives. And may you change others for the message you've given us. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you.